Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Whales and Nature Trails of Quebec, what you need to know before you go. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leaders, Eleanor Eady and Judy Wilson. Ladies, thank you so much for being here today. I can't wait to spend an hour with you in Quebec. Let's dive in. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody who's here and thanks Sunny for the lovely introduction. Um, just so you know what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to start off with an introduction to us and why we're here talking to you today um, and then go over some details of the Quebec Wales and Nature Trails trip. Specifically things like your packing list, how the itinerary works and everything else you need to know before your trip actually starts. I'm Eleanor Eady, and I'm one of our Canadian expedition leaders. I've been working with Natural Habitat as an EL for quite a while now, and I'm based in Canada, running a lot of Canadian programs, including this Quebec trip. And I've been lucky enough to be always paired up with the fabulous Judy Wilson, who's here with me today. Oh, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, we always have a very good time on our trips. Um, and uh, I've also been uh, an expedition leader with Natural Habitat Adventures for a number of years now. And um, I guide in the, uh, all the Churchill programs as well as the Quebec region. So we are going to um, dive right in and uh, start talking about where it is that we're going to be going just to get you, uh, get you oriented. So let's look at a map of Canada for a second here. And uh, we start our adventure in the province of Quebec. And the yellow star uh, is at, that's at Quebec City. That's where we're going to meet. And we head off on our adventure from there. Uh, Quebec City is in the southeast of Canada, very close to the U.S. border, uh, readily accessible by plane or road or train. And as we're going to see shortly, even by boat. Um, this is Quebec City. Um, this is where we're going to meet up. It's incredibly scenic and historic. It's just a lovely, lovely city. Um, it's one of the oldest European settlements in Canada. Uh, originally, it was called Stadacona uh, when Samuel de Champlain landed on the shores and declared that he had founded it. That was in 1608. Um, today, there is a little over 540,000 people who live in Quebec City. Um, and for any of you who have traveled to Canada, you may be aware that we have two official languages. And if you're not aware of that, you certainly will be by the time you leave Quebec. Um, both of these languages, French and English, are used at the federal level. Uh, but in the province of Quebec, it's overwhelmingly French speaking. Uh, it's around 85 percent and approximately 44 percent of the people living there um, identify as being bilingual or bilingue in French uh, and it's really feels like it really feels like stepping into a, a completely different culture when you're in Quebec it's really awesome um, when you're in Quebec City you will find that there's a lot of services that you'll be able to get in English but also French will be will be quite will be quite predominant um, English becomes less present as we travel north on our on our trip, um, but the language is such an integral part of embracing and enjoying the, pe the people and the culture of Quebec that uh, we find it to be a really fantastic part of, of the program. And we want you to be aware that um, you will be greeted in French in most places, um, and many of the menus will be in French, but English will um, be available and English menus will be available. And uh, for those of you who only speak English, which is most of you, uh, you'll be okay in Quebec City. And as we move out, you will encounter more French. And that's what we're here to help with, among other things. And you can ask us for help. And both of us are, uh, Eleanor in particular, is awesome in French. And um, I, my claim to fame is I can speak enough French that we don't get lost or miss a meal. So um, next, we're going to talk about... Um, uh, some of the places that we're going to be going and, and talk about water for a minute. Um, for much of our trip, we are either on or near water. So let's talk about that. Um, the Great Lakes drain into the St. Lawrence. Uh, these are shared boundary waters between the U.S. and Canada. And the St. Lawrence is comprised of three parts. It's got the river and then the estuary and the gulf. 
um, it's one of the largest estuaries in the world. And when we're in Quebec City, that's where the tides begin um, and they extend 500 miles upriver. Um, so the St. Lawrence is about 1900 miles from the furthest headwater to the mouth um, at the Atlantic. And um, at Quebec City, we will see the river and it's only about two miles wide. And by the time you get up into the Gulf, it's 90 miles wide. So it's a really diverse um, waterway. Uh, we will be at a, a place called Tadasac for a, a few days of our visit. And that's where full salinity is reached. And there's a whole bunch of really cool reasons what makes that really important. And we're going to talk about that extensively on our trip. Um, and it's interesting to note that the Tadasac area is not well known as a whale watching spot. Uh, maybe it's because it's a river and we're used to thinking of whales being in open oceans, but uh, however, it's, it's, not, it's not well known for whales, but once you're there, you're going to be blown away by, by the opportunities there to see whales. Most Canadians, like Eleanor and I, our friends, most of them don't even know that this is a, a hot spot or a gem for, for seeing whales. So zooming in a little bit further, let's look at where we're actually going to be. The red circle is where Quebec City is. Um, and then all of those stars, including the blue star, um, those are actually parks. Those are the major locations that we're going to be visiting. The first three days of our trip, we're going to be focusing on whale watching in the Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Park. This is where the St. Lawrence widens and where we've got full salinity in the water. That's right in that blue star. So to get there, that's the first leg of our trip. We head out of Quebec City. And then we go along the north shore of the St. Lawrence estuary to the town of Tadoussac. And, um, and that's right where that S of the Saguenay Marine Park name is. And that's going to take us a, a good morning of driving to get there. And that's where we're going to see that the, the, there's a widening to the, uh, to the river. And that's where the Saguenay Fjord enters the St. Lawrence River, just below that, that top blue star. And that's where we're going to be heading to. After our whale watching activities uh, are done, uh, after the first few days, we are gonna start looping through the land-based parks. Those are represented by those yellow stars. So at the end of this adventure, we'll have explored five parks as well as a number of portions of the Charlevoix Biosphere region. And um, the parks that we're gonna be hitting will be the Saguenay Fjord National Park, the Haute Gorge de la Riviere Malbaie National Park, Grand Jardin and Jacques Cartier National Parks. And we would like to acknowledge that we will be traveling through the traditional lands of the Nitasinen, Abenaki, Kanankikaha, Mikwa, Mi'kmaq, sorry, Inu, and the Wendaki, as well as a number of other indigenous groups. So enough about water. Let's get to Eleanor to help us figure out what to wear on our adventure. Thanks, Judy, for that, that initial overview there. So I want to go through some of our information on packing. And before I get into this, I do want to refer, for those of you who are traveling with us this year, um, you will be receiving a document called a pre-departure briefing. And within that pre-departure briefing is going to be a list of suggested packing items, uh, as well as all of our tips and tricks and recommendations for what you should keep in mind when packing. But we don't want to leave you with just that written list. I want to go through some of those details with you right now as well. Um, keeping in mind that these trips do run in August as well as September and even into early October. And as you can imagine, within that time frame, there can be significant weather variations from a lovely hot mid-August afternoon to an early morning in October. Um, so keep in mind what time of year you're traveling at. And within that pre-departure briefing, you will also have information about the average temperature to give you an idea at what time of year you're traveling, what kind of temperatures you might expect to encounter. Now, things that you're going to want to make sure that, that you have with you every day are things like uh, a day pack to carry the items with you that you'll need during your hike or during your time on the water. Um, you are going to receive a Natural Habitat Adventures water bottle as well as a buff, which is a, um, like a, a lightweight gaiter for around your neck, and luggage tags, and those will all come in handy during this trip. Uh, we recommend bringing a sun hat as well as a warm hat. We recommend um, sunglasses if you are wearing um, 
corrective lenses. These might be prescription sunglasses, but even for those who don't wear corrective lenses, having some polarized sunglasses can just really make your time on the water more comfortable and enjoyable to reduce the glare coming off the water. One of the things that we're going to be emphasizing are layers, 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 and options. Um, so while one day we may have a really cold morning, we may be by the afternoon in t-shirts. So as we go through the slides for this uh, presentation, keep in mind that all of these images were taken during trips. And so all the things that you see people wearing are items that people found helpful during their trips. Um, now, I'll go into some more details on like specific activities and what we're going to be wearing for those. But we also get a lot of questions about, well, how are we going to be viewing things? What kind of optics do I need to bring with me? Um, and this might apply to photography or it might apply to binoculars. If you're wondering, should I bring binoculars? Our advice would be, yes, please do. And if you have a pair of good binoculars, bring your good binoculars. These are especially helpful if you like looking at birds. Um, anybody who's interested in birds will probably bring along their binoculars anyway. And binoculars can also be a great way to get a different kind of view, um, especially if we're around, for example, a species that we may not be allowed to approach at a very close distance because it's a, it's a it's a managed endangered species. Um, so what kind of uh, binoculars? So when you look at binoculars, there'll be numbers on them. Ones that Judy and I usually use are usually are eight by 42s. So when you look at the number, it's an eight X 42. Some people also like 10 X, so a 10 times magnification, either with a 42 or a 50. We've always got people ready to talk uh, binocular recommendations. And if anybody has more specific questions about that, we can get into that towards the end of the presentation too. Now, as far as your cameras go, um, again, as we're going through the slideshow, the probably all actually of the images that we have in this presentation were taken with a smartphone. So you can get great images just using your iPhone or your Android smartphone. If you're thinking about bringing a larger camera, um, you'll want to make sure that you have a dry bag or another uh, way to protect your camera if you're taking it out on the water to watch whales or out on a rainy day. And honestly, Judy and I talked about this and we both agree that when we're out with the whales, a single lens, probably uh, some kind of an adaptable telephoto like a 100 to a 400 millimeter is going to be um, your best bet. Uh, and then if you want to bring other lenses along for landscape photography, for example, that's always welcome as well, of course. Now, one of the more critical items to think about how you want to or what you want to bring is going to be your footwear. Your footwear needs to work for your feet. We're going to be out. It's a, This is an eight-day trip, and pretty well the majority of the days we are out walking, at least at some point. So that means that your boots should be like broken in, but also in good shape. So nothing that's about to fall apart on you. You don't need heavy duty mountaineering boots, but we would really recommend a good quality hiking boot, or at a, at a minimum, something like a waterproof hiking shoe. Um, most of us prefer the hiking boots for a little bit more ankle support. Now, with these hiking boots, these are gonna be what you wear most of the time. Now we'll talk about zodiacs in a second, and I'm going to tell you that when we're out on the water uh, looking for whales, it's not infrequent at all. In fact, it's, it's quite often that we get off the water pretty well, salt like covered in salt water head to toe, and that will include your footwear. So what we recommend doing is bringing along a second pair of shoes, whatever that might look like, whether it's a second pair of hikers or um, what I do is bring along a pair of runners and they're a pair of hiking boots. And that way I've always got a pair of dry shoes to wear while my shoes from the morning uh, are wet. Now, if you're somebody who likes to travel with hiking poles, those are, are certainly an option for you to bring along with you if they help your comfort over uneven ground. Um, Judy's going to show later some of the typical trails that we use. There's nothing that's what we'd call really technical, but some people still prefer those hiking poles for a little bit of stability or ease of comfort. Uh, sometimes like 
If you have hip problems, for example, it can help to take some of your weight off an injured area. Um, so you can bring them along with you. They have to fit inside your luggage case because we don't have a way of storing them on the bus if they're not inside your luggage. But another option as well is that a lot of the parks that we visit do have hiking poles available for rent. And if they don't have them available for rent, they will have them available for purchase if you decide that that's something that you really need to bring along with you. So take a look at the difference between that slide, shorts and a t-shirt, and this slide, all the layers. This is on the same trip. So the, the guests on this trip went through some really cool temperatures on the water and then some really warm temperatures inland while hiking. So while we are on our whale watching part of our expedition, your uh, lovely yellow bibs there, those waterproof bib pants and that red waterproof flotation jacket are provided. So you don't need to bring waterproof layers specifically for the Zodiac, but you will want waterproof layers for hiking, for example, because we do still go out and go hiking even if it is raining out. Um, you can notice here that these people are quite layered up and that's because of that, those cold temperatures on the water. So we'd recommend uh, no matter what time of year you're heading out, making sure that you have a pretty decent warm hat, good waterproof gloves, and at least a puffy jacket. Um, and if you run towards being cold, I would suggest adding in a puffy vest as well as your puffy jacket for that time on the water. There may be folks also wondering what's needed for kayaking. We don't have any needs for any kayak specific gear. All the things that we're telling you to bring for regular walking and other activities are gonna serve you well on the kayak as well. Though Judy will touch on some more details around what, kayak, what kayaking gear might be needed on warm days versus cool days as we get into our activities section. So just to give you an idea kind of what those average temperatures are like, I know that these are centigrade temperatures and not everybody works in, in Celsius. Um, these are temperatures in the Tadoussac area. Tadoussac, as Judy mentioned, is right on the St. Lawrence. It is, has a more of a maritime influence, so it tends to be cooler than the more inland areas. So our, at the peak of summer, we're looking at a daytime high temperature of around 21 degrees Celsius or around four, uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit with lows in the mid 50s or around 13 degrees Celsius. And if you are traveling in October, you can see that that temperature drops quite significantly with daytime highs around eight degrees Celsius, which will be something like around um, 50, like the high, no, low 50s Fahrenheit. There's also a decent amount of rainfall, though of course weather is weather and there's always going to be variation within um, what we encounter. Some trips we have rain most days and some trips are sunny almost every day. We have received a number of questions and, and we talk about this as well regarding some of the air quality questions that have come up, especially along the eastern part of North America. Um, if you spent any time outside, basically anywhere in the continent this spring, you've probably run into at least some smoky days with perhaps poor air quality. Uh, and a lot of these fires are found within kind of the central area of Quebec and it's blowing smoke down to those of you who may be in New York or other areas along the Northeast coast. So we are aware of the situation. We are monitoring it and we're keeping very much of an eye on it. At this point, like we're not anticipating any itinerary changes because we're looking at trips that aren't beginning until the late summer and into the fall. And typically we'd expect some big changes in what that fire behavior is doing between now and then. Uh, but do know that while we have expectations that the, the smoky conditions are going to be well gone by the fall. We will still be monitoring this uh, as the weeks go, go through. All of the parks that we operate in are open right now. And we work, with, um, we work with some fantastic people. We have great ELs, we have great partners on the ground. And for all of us, safety is our number one priority. And do know that we are always having those conversations. We have options for shifting timings around or locations as we we may need to do if air quality is higher in one area or another. And if we need to make those changes on the ground for a more enjoyable experience, we will absolutely be doing that. And 
you can count on people like myself and Judy and all our other EL and NetHub team to be making this the best experience possible. So let's start by your uh, talking about your arrival in Quebec City. This is a, a lovely nighttime shot of the um, International Airport in Quebec City. It is a small airport. Uh, for those of you who are flying into Canada, you will likely fly through a different airport, probably Montreal or Toronto, and go through customs in that first place of landing. And by the time you land in Quebec City, it's likely to be uh, considered a domestic arrival. Now, if you haven't traveled to Canada for a while and maybe you tried traveling during COVID when there was a lot of paperwork involved, just know that right now there, there's no longer any of that special COVID paperwork required. All you need is your normal passport um, and entry requirements as per normal. Um, you may notice in Canada especially that there are people who choose to wear face masks on the planes and in the airports, but it's not mandatory at this point. Uh, for all of our guests who are arriving on day one of the trip, we are going to have transfers available for you from the airport to our hotel. And transfers are also going to be provided if you are arriving early, but going to that same hotel book through us. So we have to know that you're coming in and you have to have booked that hotel th through us for us to know that that transfer is, is required. Um, so that transfer company, we use a, a local transportation company. You're going to come down an escalator, you'll collect your baggage at the baggage carousel. That's all within a secure area. And then you exit some sliding glass doors. And just outside those sliding glass doors is going to be your driver, probably either holding up a sign with your name or a sign that says NatHab, and they are there for you to take you to our, um, our first hotel, which is the Hotel Le Germain. Now, if you're arriving earlier than that, and you're looking for transportation to the hotel, Taxis are readily available at the airports, no matter where in Quebec City you're going. If you're coming to the Hotel Le Germain, it's about a 35 minute drive, um, but Quebec City is not a huge area. So if you've picked an airport hotel or something like that, they'll be easily accessible as well. Uh, something I do wanna mention is that in a lot of cases, the taxi drivers won't be English speakers. So you'll wanna make sure that you have your hotel address pulled up on your smartphone or on a piece of paper so that you can hand it to your driver and they can plug it into their, their GPS system. Uh, if you need to pick up some money, you can do money exchange at the airports or there's also a lot of banks and ATMs available in Quebec City as well. So to talk further about our, um, our ho lovely hotel here, I'll hand things back to Judy. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, yeah, we're gonna meet on our very first day at the Hotel Le Germain. Uh, this is a beautiful boutique hotel. It's centrally located in old Quebec. So it's walking distance from a ton of attractions, great restaurants, um, cultural um, cultural places, uh, and the St. Lawrence River is right there as well. So it's a really gorgeous location. Um, the front desk staff at the Le Germain are bilingual and they are a truly awesome resource. They are very helpful if you have any questions on what to do, how to get to places, where things are, or if you're looking for an ATM, uh, they are able to help you with that. This is also where we're gonna have our welcome orientation and dinner on our day one. Uh, it's gonna be at the hotel, um, and we're here just for the one night, and from there, we are going to be moving to some of our other hotels, but let's look at, first let's look at our modes of transportation um, for the next number of days throughout our trip. So we will be moving by bus from place to place. Depending on the size of the group, it, the type of bus may differ. Uh, so it may be anything from a comfortable sprinter style bus or a coach bus. Um, and we have tons of opportunities to take breaks, stretch our legs, and uh, get out and enjoy some of the things that, that Quebec has to offer. But this is not the only way that we're gonna be getting around by bus. We are also going to be spending a fair bit of time on the water. And it goes without saying that uh, some of the best whale watching is usually by boat. So we have three excursions planned uh, with, our, uh, with our partner, our, our indigenous partner, Isipit and they will take us out in their Zodiacs. These Zodiacs are super safe, uh, very comfortable. You sit with your, back facing, with your back facing out onto the water. 
Um, and these boats get us into a really great position to view to view the whales and the captains are all keeping in touch with each other. So they do they do communicate as to where they're seeing seeing wildlife. And depending on how many guests, we may split into two zodiacs. But on this trip, you do have two expedition leaders. So if we do split into two, one of us will be in each boat. Um, and there's lots of room on these boats. We are the only people on here. So um, yeah, so we're going to, uh, we'll talk in a minute about what to wear on these boats. Um, and the other form of transportation may be, not necessarily, but it may be in one of our parks. And depending on the timing of your trip, we may be transferred within one of the parks to the higher elevation visitor center that we go to um, on a park shuttle bus. Um, and this helps reduce the congestion in the, in the parks, restricts private vehicles within the body of the park, and it controls traffic. So we don't have, it's not a private bus or anything. There's no reservation. So if we are on this bus, we just have to be patient, but often they just wave us through depending on the uh, traffic in the park. The other thing that's kind of cool is that um, I mentioned that we're going to be going up the St. Lawrence River and we will be hitting the Saguenay Fjord. Well, not hitting it, but we will be approaching the Saguenay Fjord uh, where it hits, where it, where it dumps into the St. Lawrence. And in order to get to Tadoussac, we have to cross the Saguenay Fjord to the other side. So we take this ferry. The ferry takes about 10 minutes to cross. So we, we wait, we get on, the, we drive our bus uh, right onto the ferry. You can get off the bus while the ferry is crossing. And um, this is what we will be doing on day two in order to get to Tadoussac and to our whale watching areas. Then we'll, after that, we'll move, uh, we'll have to cross the ferry with the ferry again to get um, onto our other destinations after our few days that we spend in Tadoussac. So once we're on the ferry and you get off the bus, you're able to get up onto the upper deck. And uh, it's kind of cool because on our, on our arrival um, to Tadasak, this may be your first view, potential view of whales as you cross the Saguenay Fjord. So we're going to pass over to Eleanor and take a look at some of the hotels that we stay in after we leave a Hotel Le Germain in Quebec City. Thank you. Yeah, so as Judy was mentioning, day two is our transfer time out of Quebec City and into our more rural and remote areas. We spend one night as a group at Hotel Le Germain, and then every two nights thereafter, we are switching to a new location. Our first hotel after Quebec City is going to be in the town of Tadoussac, and this is a, we've seen this hotel now in this presentation from a couple of different angles. The ferry terminal is actually on the far left of this image here, and the red roof in the center is the Hotel Tadoussac. It is facing directly out onto the St. Lawrence River, so it's got great views from a lot of areas of the hotel, and it is um, possible to perhaps even sometimes whales are seen right from the hotel itself. It's a beautiful old sprawling resort hotel, that has maintained a lot of its original charm and, and character, and it's always a fun place to, to go to. So two days there, focusing on our whale watching, and then we are going to be transferring to the, the village of La Malve and staying at the Fairmont Le Manuel Richelieu in this location. So this is a, a Fairmont hotel, as you might imagine from this, it is a, a lovely upscale, beautiful hotel with many amenities and services. The St. Lawrence estuary is still on our left hand side here, so a lot of the hotel still has great views of the estuary. Um, and from this location, we are going to be accessing a couple of the parks that we're visiting, uh, which are the Park uh, of the Haute Gorge of de la Rivière Malve and the Park Grand Jardin. And then our last hotel that we stay at is a much smaller hotel, but also incredibly charming. This is the Manoir Lac de Lage. So it is close to both Quebec City and to the Parc de Jacques Cartier, where we're going to be visiting as well. And we spend two nights here, and then on our final morning, we are going to be transferring from the Manoir Lac de Lage to the airport or the train station or elsewhere in Quebec City as you, uh, as you depart. So I'm gonna go over to my favorite slide of this whole presentation, which is Judy trying to cram a whole croissant into her mouth and uh, leave Judy to talk about food. 
Okay, so just, you know, full disclosure, croissants are a food group in Quebec, and this one has chocolate in it, so it's kind of like a double whammy food group. So this is, uh, we're kind of all about croissants on this trip, so please never hesitate to request a pit stop for these delicious treats. We're happy to do so. Um, but speaking of food, uh, a trip to Quebec would would not be um, would not be complete without um, ex experiencing some of the food. It's wonderful, rich uh, local cuisine that we are going to be introducing you to. Um, and of course, this is why we do so much hiking is to burn off all of the calories. Um, one thing that we do want to caution is um, it takes a little while to produce this kind of lovely cuisine. So don't expect our meals to be fast. Um, you may be, you also may be eating later than you're used to. Um, and everything is on Quebec time, as we like to say. But um, we will not let you go hungry. We always have snacks on the bus. Um, and we did mention croissants, I think, but uh, we always have snacks. Um, and you just have to be patient in Quebec. Nothing happens overly quickly when it comes to restaurants. Um, but for lunches, we will be getting, usually be getting packed lunches so that we are free to be on our own schedule. And it gives us flexibility um, to go to some different places depending on weather and what's happening. Often we'll go to a park to take best advantage of the time that we have there. Um, because of some of these things that I've just said, it's really important that you do let NADHAB know and let us know of any dietary needs. Some of you may have um, signed up for this trip um, a while ago, and if your dietary has changed in the meantime, please let your adventure specialist know. We do need to know in advance um, some of these places that we're going to, despite the fact that we're in Quebec, they are considered remote areas and some of our menus are set uh, in advance, um, so we do need to know all this. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Eleanor to get you pumped up for some whale watching and look at some of the pictures from here. Thanks. So this is our whales and trails, and I guess I won the coin flip. I get to talk about the whales, though the trails are pretty great too. Uh, as we start talking about the activities on this itinerary, one of the things that we want to highlight is that they are all optional. Whether you're having a day where you'd rather spend time at the local museum or you would prefer to have a quiet morning in, it's often quite possible for us to um, find a way to meet up after the activity is done if there's something that you want to sit out on. Now, of course, on those transfer days when we're leaving one hotel and going to the other one, you can't opt out of that unless you don't want to come with us to the, the rest of the trip. But in a lot of cases, um, spending time on your own can be a great option, whether it's at a park visitor center or at a local cafe. Um, and this can even include, like if you'd like to, we, we do three whale watching excursions. Um, and sometimes folks just would like to sit and have a cup of coffee for the third one, or if they might want, want to opt out. And that's always absolutely fine. So we already talked a little bit about the, what you need to wear, lots of layers, warm layers. Um, as you can see from this wonderful color coordinated group, um, all of those those bibs and jackets are provided. And we're looking for us to have warm layers underneath, a warm hat, polarized sunglasses if it's a sunny day, and waterproof shoes um, to keep your feet happy. Now we meet up and get geared up at the uh, Isipit area here, and then we're gonna walk down this ramp towards the Zodiac launch area. It looks like a steep ramp, but it's actually not so bad. And there's lots of grippiness. They've, they put cross bracing on the, on the ramp, ramp so that you don't fall down. And there's good handrails to get you down there as well. And that ramp takes you to this here. You can see that that ramp kind of on the right there isn't as steep as it looks in that image. Uh, it is a floating dock and it goes up and down with the tides. So that ramp is sometimes pretty steep and it's sometimes not steep at all. So boarding the Zodiac is very easy and it's assisted by your expedition leader as well as the boat captain to get you on there and safe. And on our first expedition, we'll go through a, a safety briefing so you know what's what on the Zodiac. And in the background, you can see there in the top left-hand corner, this is where we gear up for our, uh, our Zodiac expedition. But on top of the gear room, there's also a lovely cafe and museum. 
So this is a great place if anybody is electing to skip a Zodiac, you can still have a lovely morning sitting up in the cafe and they've even got a spotting scope there so you can watch for whales even from the cafe itself. The Zodiac expeditions are usually around two hours long, though sometimes they get pushed a little bit longer if we're, if we're seeing stuff and we get far away. Um, you have washrooms accessible right, right before and right after the Zodiac ride, so uh, should be just fine on the Zodiac. If you've got a history of back problems or you're concerned about bumpiness on the Zodiac or perhaps you're concerned about uh, motion sickness, just make sure to talk to your expedition leader and we'll have a word with the captain as well. And we do have recommendations about where are better places to sit and perhaps some better postures that might keep you comfortable on the Zodiac if it's rough out. Um, so it's not always rough, but sometimes it is. We are in a marine area. Uh, it could be anything from sunny and warm to misty and cool uh, with, with decent sized waves. But really, even on a nice day, we often still get wet just from the spray of the zodiacs. So it's hard to tell in this image here, but I assure you that every single person in this picture is soaking wet. They've got their hoods up, they've got their buffs pulled up for warmth, um, smiles on everybody's faces. It's still a good time. You've got great gear for it, um, but we're the, this gear gets handed out because you're expected to, to need it, right? It's gonna keep you warm and comfortable while you're out there on the water. We do all of our Zodiac expeditions with our partner, Isipit. They are an Indigenous owned company who's local to Quebec. And we've had such fantastic experiences with Isipit and we're so happy to be working with them again this year. Now, if you're wondering what you might see while you're out on the water, the St. Lawrence is home to a number of marine mammal species. These include uh, cetaceans, like the whales, as well as species like uh, seals. This image here is kind of our, our more common uh, marine mammals of the area. And common marine mammals that are seen, you know, but maybe not on every trip, but at least, you know, many times in a season by, uh, by the Zodiac captains. These will be species like the fin whale, the minke whale, the humpback whale, the St. Lawrence beluga, which is an endangered population of beluga whales the harbor porpoise, and then our seals, which include um, the gray seal would be our most common of our, our seals that we're seeing. Now you'll notice at the bottom there, there's another one that I haven't mentioned, that's the blue whale. The blue whale is considered what we call an occasional visitor, meaning that there is a population, they come in every summer, they don't often come all the way up towards Tadoussac, they prefer to stay up near the mouth of the, of the Gulf of the St. Lawrence, but they, they are seen sometimes, and they're seen usually at least sometimes in the year, even if they're not seen frequently. Now, those aren't the only species. There's also a handful of, like, oops, excuse me, known but uncommon species. So these are our rare visitors to the St. Lawrence. So looking from kind of the, the going clockwise from the top left here, we have the long fin pilot whale, the white beaked dolphin, the Atlantic white sided dolphin, the killer whale, I bet you Pick that one out already. The sperm whale and the, um, the North Atlantic right whale. And then the last one there, the kind of almost pinkish one there is the Northern bottlenose whale. And so, like I said, these are uncommon or rare visitors. We wouldn't necessarily expect to see these, but I do know that some of our trips have had, had luck spotting at least a couple of these species. Now it's not just whales that you're gonna see while you're out there and it's not just seals. There's a lot of cool seabirds out there as well. Uh, some of the common ones that we often encounter are again, top left going clockwise or common eider. Um, next one there is the razor bill. Um, bottom right is the Northern gannet. And then on the bottom left, we have a black legged kittiwake. Um, so all lovely birds and all frequently found in the St. Lawrence estuary. So that's our whales section. I'm going to hand things back to Judy to talk about trails. Thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, it's always exciting to see all the whales and the birds um, getting us amped up for the season. Um, but I know uh, we know that many of you will be wondering about what to pack for hiking. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of an overview. Um, we do hike in five different parks on and uh, on land, obviously. Um, and they all have different elevation, terrains, and habitats. So we're gonna 
show some, some images of what those different terrains may look like. And again, keep an eye out for what people are wearing in these pictures because these were all these are all taken um, from uh, from the, from our trips. Uh, one thing that Eleanor and I have discovered is that um, the system of rating difficulty of hikes in Quebec is not necessarily the standard that you may be used to from elsewhere. We came to the conclusion that they rate a trail as being easy when it's a short trail. So that that could be a straight up trail. Uh, super high elevation and they think it's easy um, so we have we've we've tested all these trails and we know we know which ones are are usually working for our guests um, most of the walks that we do do involve some elevation even if it's only a couple hundred feet we've got steepness that varies from trail to trail or park to park as does the footing and of course the footing may depend on the weather and how wet things are um, so we're going to show these upcoming slides of the walks and the portions of trails. Um, the other thing is, is that we select most of our walks to be around three miles or less. We find that that's sort of a good average for, for people, a, a mixed group of people on a, on a trip. There may be some options for longer walks in some parks, if that's what you so desire. And we do try to split our groups up by speed and distance when we're able to do that. We're not not always can we do that, but we are cognizant that not not everybody walks the same pace and has the same abilities. So we will try to give you as many options as we can. So let's go through uh, a few pictures and also again note the clothing that's worn over the course of the season. We keep mentioning everything from t-shirts to puffy jackets and also the rain gear. Um, this this uh, picture that we just saw was from one of the parks that had a gravel road. This one that uh, as as our trail. This one here um, is a much narrower path than the last one, so we actually have to go single file on most of this trail uh, in in some of the areas of it. So it's not uncommon for us to encounter some rocks, small rocks, and tree roots on these kind of trails. And this one is from Grand um, uh, Grand Jardin National Park. And then we've got some other examples here. And again, note what people are wearing on the right and the left sides. On the left-hand picture, the footing is a little bit more uneven. It's a steeper slope. That was just a chunk of the hike. But again, if it had been wet, those rocks could be a little bit slippery. And on the right-hand side, we've got a gentle, manicured, but a very consistent slope. So you see that people are stretched out a little bit in terms of, of their speeds. Um, so many of the trails are similar to what we've got on the right hand side where they're groomed but uh, but they have a slope to them. Also you may see that some of our guests are using poles and that is pretty common um, that, uh, that people will bring their own poles to use. So as you can see in this, on these two pictures we do have the occasional scramble and this is more just a section of a trail that leads to another section that is not like this so we uh, and we will not uh, force you to go at lightning speed up these trails, but um, uh, obviously we're going to we're going to help if there's some rocks that that you need some some assistance to get over. And again, just another another image. Uh, this is a, a dried riverbed that we that we cross. So depending on on which trails we hike and what the water levels are like, you may or may not be seeing this one, or may may or may not have to uh, cross in that particular area. So we have mentioned that with the Zodiac, uh, with the boats, you do not need to bring your own rain gear for the boats. You are fully covered by a sippet for what you have to wear to be waterproof on boats. But you do need to bring waterproof jackets and likely pants for hiking in the rain. And we do hike in the rain. We do not uh, sit inside, you know, unless it's unless it's dangerous to be outside. Um, so we've got people wearing hats, uh, they've got good sturdy hiking boots, footwear, um, they're wearing their, their uh, waterproof jackets, we've got a few people with poles. Um, so hopefully that helps clear up some of the questions on, on what to wear. Um, and then we have, I mentioned earlier with the food that we try to do as many um, to go picnic lunches as possible. It allows us to get to some of the places like what's in this image here. Uh, and we're sitting here watching minke whales. 
uh, swim by in the St. Lawrence. So if the weather cooperates and the wind co cooperates, uh, this is the kind of area that we may take you to for a lunch. And if you can't sit on the rocks, and lots of people don't find that comfortable at all, there are uh, picnic tables and other areas that are comfortable to, to sit at. And so where hours of operation in the parks and, and other locations permit uh, and the weather, we will, we will try to get you out to some of these places. Also, we will try to fit in at least one interpretive center during the trip. So this is an example of one of the interpretive centers. Um, and there are many throughout the region. And uh, just know that your expedition leaders will be working to figure out what times and what locations work for these. Okay, we're gonna talk about the canoeing um, slash kayaking. Uh, this is an option at one of our parks. And again, this is weather dependent. It doesn't always happen. And it, it is a, a call that the park staff will make. If it's too windy, um, they will not let us go out for good reason. Um, so let's just talk about what you're gonna wear out in the kayak. So if you look at the people kayaking here, they all appear to be wearing sort of a light, a light jacket. This would have been in late September, early October. It was a fairly nice day, but it was chilly. Um, in, in September and October, you are going to get the odd warm day, but once you're getting on the water and you get a wind coming down the river, you're probably going to be wanting to wear a light jacket. Um, so um, the layers again, the jacket, the hat, um, maybe a pair of sweatpants or a pair of tights, um, something that you can get wet because when you sit in a kayak, often with the paddle, you'll have water dribbling down into the kayak. Um, and it's never uh, for sure that you're not going to flip a kayak. Uh, so far, our record is pretty good, but um, we will ask that you bring, you know, extra clothing just in case that happens and we'll have towels and things like that. But usually that's not needed. Um, but warm socks would be another thing that's really good. Even if you've got a pair of um, sandals on like a Tiva or those kind of, of, of sandals, you can wear a wool sock underneath to keep your feet warm. Um, shorty rubber boots. I like to have a little pair of short rubber boots for the Zodiac, but I also could use that in the kayaking. We do get you into the kayaks and push you out into the water, but some people do get their feet wet and you may have some water in the, in the boat as well. Um, what we found in particular last year is that a number of guests, their hands got cold. So I would strongly suggest that you have those gloves that you're gonna be needing for the, um, for the Zodiac anyway. You may wanna bring a couple little light pairs of gloves that you would wear um, maybe in the, in the fall or if you have a winter where you live. Um, just bring something that will keep your hands warm and keep the circulation going if, you're, if you get cold. Also a small dry bag is really helpful. You may be wanting to bring a dry bag type thing for the Zodiac anyway. But even in the kayak, if you do have a small dry bag, that's great to throw a pair of gloves in, uh, maybe a water bottle and um, uh, grab some snacks from us and throw that in there, some Kleenex, a chapstick, sunscreen, that sort of thing. Um, and again, just a reminder, if your heart is starting to palpitate looking at people kayaking, um, notice that, they're, they're, um, that we have single kayaks and double kayaks. So we will, we will sort that out with you upon your arrival. Uh, to Quebec, but also um, if being on the water is not for you, um, you know, remember that all activities are optional and uh, there's, there's a really lovely walk along the river where you can actually watch the people kayaking and take some pictures for us, um, or there, there's a lovely visitor center as well. So there are other things that you can do besides being on the water kayaking. So we are gonna, we've got lots of time here for some questions. Uh, usually we do get some questions about what to pack and camera gear and all that stuff. So we're happy to try and answer any of those questions. And I would like to point out again, take a look at what these folks are wearing. This was one of the later trips last year. So there's long sleeves, there's uh, some puffy uh, jackets happening and an extra jacket. So that should, and poles, that should give you a, a little bit of a sense for what, what lots of people like to bring. So I'm gonna hand it over to Sunny to uh, manage our questions and Eleanor and I will see what we can do. Thank you so much. This just looks like such an incredible trip. I'm very <laughs> envious of all of you who are going to be showing up in Quebec later this year. 
Um, we've got lots of great questions, um, some overlaps. So I'll start with some simple ones. Can you accommodate vegans on a trip like this? Elna, do you want to tackle that one? I'm happy to answer that, answer that one because I'm somebody who, uh, while not fully vegan, I, I avoid dairy. So I've had my eyes open for that. Um, we are able to accommodate special dietary restrictions, including veganism. What we do suggest if you're coming in with that specific kind of dietary need is that you may want to like either like very much flag it for not having in advance, as well as consider bringing some of your own preferred snack items, uh, especially things like high protein snacks, things like that. Um, we are going to be able to accommodate your meals, though there may not be a whole lot of choice involved at various times. Um, there, you may, you will likely get the vegan option, and that is what is available. Um, when we know in advance, your expedition leaders are able to kind of supplement the snacks as well, and make sure that we have nuts and fruit and things like that on hand, to, so that nobody's going hungry at any point. Um, and I can say that yes, I I was able to easily avoid dairy and I could have avoided eggs had I wanted to as well as a vegetarian. So I feel confident in saying that we would be able to manage a, a vegan diet. Great. If I could add, if I could add to that, Sunny, I think it's really mm -hmm. important, and I think I said this earlier, for for anyone who has a dietary um, restriction or um, that, that that they let not have no sooner rather than later, particularly if that has not been clearly outlined in the information that they've uh, given to us. What you what you will eat and what you won't eat is very helpful for us, particularly in Quebec once we're rolling on the road. Sounds good, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the um, transportation in vehicles? Um, how much time is spent in the vehicles and what kind of vehicles do you use? I can I can take that one. Um, the pictures that we showed are uh, the the one picture was of a coach bus. Um, so that that's one type of vehicle. Another one would be a large sprinter van. All of all of the buses that we might use are very comfortable. Um, also, in terms of the longest that we would be on a vehicle, it may be up to about three hours, and that's on a transfer day. That's not in our normal our day to day where we're going um, to to do the whale watching or anything. That's when we're moving from one location to another. Um, and I and I think Eleanor mentioned something about you know motion sickness. If anyone has motion sickness as something that they are afflicted with, they should really be bringing their medications with them. Um, Quebec is rather hilly, uh, so you know regardless of which bus we're in, some of the some of the the transfers may be you know for some people maybe windy. Eleanor, do you have anything to add to that or? Oh, I think that was quite comprehensive, Judy. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you um, touch on if there are any vaccine requirements for COVID at this point, um, as far as entering Canada? That's a great question. My understanding right now, which you should confirm before travel because things can always change, are that there are no requirements uh, for travel to Canada at this point. I believe that, that like, that's right. You know what, it's all coming back to me now. Canada dropped this requirement uh, well before the US did. So yeah, Canada dropped that a number of months ago. Great. Um, one However, of our guests, yeah. oh, sorry, interrupt, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say, just, just, to, uh, just to highlight the fact that the NatHub website does have specific up-to-date up information on entry requirements. So you're always able to go in and check whether there's anything specific for country entry requirements, as well as anything specific that might be needed for a NatHab trip or that particular NatHab trip. Great. Um, so one of our guests arrives around 8 p.m. the night before the trip begins. Can you um, confirm that taxis are readily available at that time? And is there a fixed fare into the city? Yes, so uh, taxis will be readily available during the time that planes are expected in and 8 p.m. as well within that time. 
Now, if you're arriving at 8 p.m. the day before the trip starts and you've booked the Hotel Le Germain through NatHab, we will have transportation for you at the airport. If, however, you're arriving early and you've booked a separate hotel on your own, um, yes, you will need to take a taxi at that point. The taxis that go from the airport do have a set rate. I haven't been there yet this year and they do adjust it year over year. I think it was around $40 in the last year. Um, and that covered transport from downtown to the airport. Great. Um, what is the highest elevation that you will be hiking to or going to on this trip? Oh, do we know the elevations, Eleanor? <laughs> um we could we go we in one the of the elevation our, nothing's too high like one of our parks uh in particular um we i'm thinking of oak gorge we drive up to the highest uh visitor center so we're starting from a, a higher elevation but our hiking there is not um is not particularly um elevated so i think yeah Nothing, nothing over 3,000 feet, and that would be like at 3,000 feet, you're doing the optional bigger, higher hike um, in Grand Jardin, and that would be the one up to the Crater Rim um, that would take you a, for a, a view out. But because we're really close to sea level, the majority of the time that we're we're on trip, even when we're driving up into the more hilly areas, they're not high hills. They're very frequent hills, but they're not exceptionally high. So I, I think that 3,000 feet is pretty well the peak height that we would end up at. Okay, great. Um, let's see. During the trail walks, are there predators to be aware of in the woods? And a related question, do you need to worry about mosquitoes? <laughs> Um, we'll take, we'll tackle the mosquitoes. Um, there will, depending on the time of year and um, moisture and heat and all of that, there may be, there may be some insects. Towards the end of the end of the summer, early fall, they've dissipated quite a bit. So we haven't actually had any really big issues with that with uh, insects. And we will have, um, we will have um, bug spray that. It's the DEET free and it uh, prevents uh, any damage to binoculars or camera gear, that sort of thing. So we will have we will have bug spray. Um, and we've recommended that people wear a, have a, a variety of clothing. So if there are some bugs, you may want to have longer sleeves, but it hasn't really been an issue for the timing that these trips will be. Um, and in terms of predators, there are not predators that that bother people in these parks to any to any extent we have never had a problem we've talked to many of the park people and they have advised us that there is there's really not an issue there's enough traffic through the parks um, that it that there have not been any problems I don't know if you have anything to add to that Eleanor no that's exactly what I would have said yeah great um, talk a little bit more about the kayaking um, how long is the kayak trip and what body of water will it be on? Let Judy take that one. If your internet, you're a little bit pixely there, Judy. Hmm. Yeah, I cut out for a minute. Is there another question? Sorry, if, I'm sorry about that. If you could repeat it, that'd be great. No worries. Um, interest in learning more about the kayaking trip. How long is it and what body of water will it be on? Um, the body of water is the river at um, Oak Gorge National Park. Um, so it's the river, the Malbay River. And it's really lovely. There's very little current. Um, there's not really much chop. It's quite protected, um, and we're we're paddling uh, with mountain ranges on both sides of us, so it's really gorgeous. Um, and uh, we do have uh, a partner there in Quebec who leads the kayaking, and that works out really well for us. So we've got we've got uh, one or two of them, and then both of us as expedition leaders. So we've got lots of support on the water, and we often break our groups up into um, 
a group that maybe is more experienced and a group that maybe has not paddled before so that we're we're very conscientious about keeping our groups together we do not have people straggled across the river it usually goes for a couple hours and sometimes we have some guests that just have had enough after half an hour it was a great experience i got some pictures and i want to go back and my hands are cold so we get you back to shore and there's a great visitor center there with a lovely gift shop um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that answers the question on the kayaking mm -hmm. and you mentioned pictures um, do guests share photos or is there a place that people can um, you know access photos that were taken of them or if they're not photographers that they can you know access photos to share with their friends and family when they get home great question I'll, I'll take that one um, um, yes answer is yes 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 we do have um, a photo share site that NatHab set up last year and it's working really well. So any guest that wants to share their photos can put their photos into that site. And absolutely any pictures that any of your expedition leaders take get added to that site. And I'm a bit of a photographer, so I take a ton of pictures, lots with my cell phone. Um, I have a good quality iPhone and also with my big girl camera and I will load those pictures in so I know for sure that my guests on all of my trips really appreciate getting the pictures and often I've had people struggling with getting images and they just said oh if you're taking them that's all good so we take lots of people pictures and we take lots of wildlife pictures and scenery shots so you'll get often depend depends on the expedition leader you may get a couple hundred pictures that come your way after the trip but yes everyone can share their pictures and you do get tons of pictures excellent um i'm sorry we can't get to everybody's questions um you definitely um have a concierge team and adventure specialist team to answer anything that wasn't answered today but we just have time for one more um, can you touch on the situation with the wildfires up in Quebec and how that might impact the trip? I'll let Eleanor take that one. Yeah. Thanks, Judy. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so if you've been paying attention to the to the news or you've been, like I said, you've been outside, you've probably noticed that th this has been a pretty exceptional early year for wildfires. Fires in the boreal forest are normal. They are expected every single year. We are well within the fire season. We've simply seen more fires than normal and we've seen them in areas that have been impacting air quality in, in more populated areas than they have historically. So what we are going to be doing is keeping a, a real close eye on the situation, both now when we're like well out from the trip and because fires are a very dynamic situation if there are active fires um, coming into the fall and he's like we expect there to be active fires you may not be aware of them but in the boreal forest in like until it freezes up there are always fires that are starting and this is part of the normal ecological process of the boreal forest um, as expedition leaders, we're just keeping an eye on that because we know that they can pop up at any time and they can change their behavior as well as conditions change on the ground. So as of right now, I think Judy and I and the rest of the expedition leader team, we're keeping an eye on it every so often because it's still we're still weeks and weeks out. We are still so far out for the situation to change significantly. And Historically, normally, what we would expect to see is that the fire conditions lessen as the season goes on. So that normally, as we get into the fall time, which is often like a very wet time, especially for Quebec, we see very lowered fire activity and with that less smoke activity as well. Um, we have a really good team. We have a really dynamic team. We're ready to make whatever changes need to happen on the ground. Um, and we have flexibility built into our itinerary so that if things need to change, we can change them. Uh, but we're still very hopeful at this point that things are going to progress as they normally would and that by the fall, we're not going to see really any impact from, from fires in, like impacting on our trip. Uh, we'll actually go to some areas that have been historically burned and they're really ecologically interesting. Because like I say, it's a normal part of the landscape here to have fires, but we need it to be in a way that's safe for us to visit. So 
that's what we're going to be watching for is safety both around fires and around the air quality. So I hope that that kind of answered the question and also kind of put people's minds at ease that we're we're looking at yes more fiery conditions than normal but still within kind of the normal expectations for how the boreal forest behaves in the summertime and we're just going to be watching and we're going to change if we need to change great thank you so much for clarifying that and for giving us such a thorough overview of this amazing itinerary um that's the last question we have time for today so i'll hand it back to you for closing comments well, thank you so much, Sunny, and everyone for participating today. I know that Eleanor and I are really looking forward to getting back to Quebec. And um, did we mention the croissants? <laughs> so everyone everyone listening today is going to be bugging us about croissants. So that's, that's good. But um, yeah, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you in Quebec. Eleanor? I'd like to extend my thanks as well. We're, I just know that we're all so excited. And um, still have some other exciting summer programs to get to but i know that this is waiting for me in the fall and i just can't can't wait for it to come and i can't wait to meet some of you out there right now so thanks everybody and thanks sunny as well and uh it's been a great afternoon i also want to thank everybody who tuned in please join us again tomorrow for our next daily dose of nature you can check out this week's lineup including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars we did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.